Hello, everybody. Um, we have a lot of online people. So for the interest of the people that they know what's going on here, I'm, in, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth Barani. I'm currently the president of CATS. Um, and I have a colleague here with me. Together, Dima and I will be moderating the presentation. And the presentation will be recorded. I want to make a few quick logistical statements um, about CAGS. Our Christmas party is December 17th at the usual place, Duke of York. If you are interested, if you are in the vicinity, please register. All the information is online. I'll skip any other text matters. If you have any questions, please uh, come to, uh, talk to us after the presentation. We have a good turnout here. I would say roughly about 30 people, and we should have a lot of people online. For the people that are here, if you have any questions, please bear with us. Uh, Richard will repeat your question for the benefit of the remote attendees before answering. Uh, for the benefit of the people online, we have you all muted, just in case there is any type of road work down outside your window. I apologize for that, but you do have a chat window, so you can post your questions, we will read them, and uh, you will receive the answers to your questions. Now, um, I'll proceed with the introduction. Dr. Richard Smith received his uh, BSc and MSc from the University of Adelaide in Australia, and then MSc and PhD here from the University of Toronto. After that, Richard accumulated industry experience with Lamontine, Kalsminko, Geoterex, Everything Fulbro, that became CGG, and I'm not sure if I'm missing anything. In 2009, uh, Richard took a, up an industrial research chair in exploration geophysics at Laurentian University in Sudbury, where he still is. Uh, he's actively involved with various committees at the SEG, AEG, ASEG, PDAC, and probably a lot more. Um, in 2009-2010, Richard was the CSEG Distinguished Lecturer. He's also uh, prolifically published in books and uh, various uh, geophysical journals. With this, I pass it on to you, Richard. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a... Um, uh, talk that I was invited to give at the ASCG meeting. We Sorry, don't have a screen. Wait a second. Yeah. We missed the screen. There is a, um, <laughs> <laughs> please bear with wide. us for a moment. Everyone <laughs> online can see. The lights on. The lights on. Okay. Um, <laughs> because it's connected to. Do you know which one it's connected to under here? Yeah. That's no good for the local audience. That is the one that came out of where? Okay, what if I did I Yeah, um, I don't know what it's connected to. It sounds like it's on. I can see the lens. It's just not connected to. Too much attention to. There we go. All right, you're good. <laughs> right, yeah, that is good. You had to go down to your knees for it to work. Okay, so um, this is a, a talk that I was asked to give at the ASCG meeting in uh, Australia in August, and uh, they gave me a 50-minute slot. So this talk is going to be about 50 minutes. Um, so I'll get started. Um, I'm going to be talking about multiple receivers and multiple transmitters and uh, the advantages that come from using multiple receivers and multiple transmitters. 
Uh, one of the issues is with all that data, how do you display the results? So I'll touch a little bit on that. And then I'll talk a little bit about three component transmitters, uh, which is an idea that uh, um, I think will be very useful for uh, what I call directing the fields. And also, if you use uh, multiple three component receivers in conjunction with those three component transmitters, then you can focus the fields as well. So I'll explain a little bit what I mean by focusing. And then I'll also talk about uh, how to display the results. And then the final topic of the talk is um, how you can use a three component transmitter and a three component receiver to detect the so called perfect conductor, the highly conductive body that uh, people are interested in. And uh, then you'll have some questions, and I've sort of anticipated these questions. I'll talk a little bit about the issues. Okay, so um, this work uh, wasn't conceived in isolation. It's picking up on some themes that have been worked on previously by various people. Um, the idea of multiple receivers has been used before. Uh, Western Mining built their geoferret system, and they had multiple receivers laid out. And uh, other people are working on multiple receivers, mostly in um, uh, IP and resistivity surveys. But some people are starting to develop systems that can be used in EM. Uh, Zong, SJG Physics, and Lamentane are working towards or have achieved this goal. Um, people have been working with multiple transmitters as well, and um, abitibi has been doing a little bit of work. I think Lamentane has done some work as well. Um, and uh, um, one of my students, Josh Limburn, who's in the audience here, did some work as well uh, using multiple transmitters and receivers, although the transmitters were Z component transmitters only, and uh, that work was done at Laurentian with some help from Abitibi Geophysics. So I mentioned the geoferret system, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, this is a slide that uh, I, um, I got from uh, Howard Golden, and it just shows the layout. This is the transmitter loop uh, here, and um, you may have 20 receivers, for example, and you lay them out along these purple positions here, here 20 of them. And you start off laying at the one uh, near the transmitter loop, for example, and then you lay the next one out and the next one out and the next one out. And by the time you've got to the end of the line, it's about an hour later, and the receiver that you laid down first has been sitting there collecting data for an hour. And an hour's worth of data is going to give you uh, very good signal-to-noise uh, rejection. So um, by the time you pick it up uh, an hour or so later, it's got good data, and then you'll move it to the next line. So you'll move this one over here, and then you move this one over here, and then you collect the second line's worth of data. So um, Western Mining argued that uh, by doing this, having multiple receivers out and leaving them there for hours at a time, they got uh, good signal-to-noise uh, ratios. And here's some words from Jim McNay talking about how you can get a depth of investigation that's four to five times greater. Uh, and uh, um, those are words from an esteemed geophysicist, but the, the proof was always in the pudding. And indeed, uh, Western Mining used this uh, geoferret system in the cliffs area, and uh, they collected this data, and lo and behold, they discovered an ore body at uh, something like uh, 450 meters depth or something like that. And you can see here, this is the, the uh, Z-X component data, and this is the Z component data. So uh, this is a, a deep ore body. So, um, as so often happens with uh, new systems, on the first survey, um, they found something. So that's multiple receivers. Um, the idea of multiple transmitters has been around a little bit. There's been some work done it, on it, and most recently, Abitibi Geophysics have been using the Infinitem system, which is uh, a particular configuration of loop uh, that is essentially two transmitters uh, laid out at once. In this particular case, there's a transmitter to the north here and a transmitter to the south. And uh, these north and south transmitters are in opposite polarities to each other. So they will couple very well to a vertical conductor. So here's a, um, um, a map of the fields, uh, a vector map of the fields from a single loop. And this is just an example to show you what, uh, what the fields look like. So here's the loop here. and uh, right underneath the fields are pointing up. So if you have a vertical conductor here, you're, you're not going to couple to it at all. This is a null coupling situation. Uh, so you don't induce any current in the, in the vertical conductor and you don't see it at all. If you want to couple to a 
vertical conductor, you have to come over here uh, where the fields are horizontal and these fields here will couple well to a vertical conductor. But by the time you're over here, the strength of the field is much less. Here the colors indicate uh, field strength and green is a lot weaker than over here where it's yellow or even orange. So uh, in order to get the right orientation, you have to sacrifice uh, field strength by moving um, your loop away from your vertical conductor. So that's a weakness of using just a single loop like that. So this is the, the two loop configuration that Avitibi use where uh, in this case the loop to the left is, uh, has a field pointing up and the loop to the right has a field pointing down and halfway in between the field is horizontal and the field strength is much greater. It's orange in that case. So uh, in this red box here you get a good coupling to a vertical conductor. So in this particular case, Abitibi Geophysics use this configuration because they want to couple to a particular uh, body in a particular position in a particular orientation. Uh, and if it's a different position or orientation, they don't necessarily uh, get good coupling. For example, if the, if the body turned out to be over here by accident because they didn't know where it was very accurately, um, then they wouldn't couple to it. And here's some interesting data that um, uh, where uh, Nimick and Cook um, did the same sort of thing. They had a, a single loop transmitter. Here's the red loop here to the left. And down here, these arrows show the fields. This is the vertical conductor here. And the field here is horizontal, so it couples well to this vertical conductor. So you get this X component response that peaks and a Z component response that has a crossover. And you notice that the amplitudes here are um, uh, about this big, so uh, on my screen that's about uh, two or three centimeters. Uh, on, on the screen there it's about uh, six inches or so or something like that. 0.73 furlongs. So now this is the same situation, but this is the dual loop configuration, the infinitum configuration, uh, which is also used in the Athabasca Basin. And now um, you've got a transmitter to the left and another one to the right, opposite polarity, and the fields again are horizontal so they couple well to this vertical conductor and you see now that the amplitudes are twice as big. So you get stronger fields uh, exciting the vertical conductor and so you get stronger responses. So that means you get better signal to noise ratio because the, the noise of your receiver doesn't change but the signal increases. So that's an example of the advantage of this dual loop configuration when looking for vertical conductors in between the two loops. And uh, Nimick and Cook also published uh, a particularly interesting example where they constructed this dual loop configuration by taking two separate surveys, one with a single loop uh, and then another survey with another single loop and they flipped the polarity of the second loop, say the one on the right, and then added the, the two of them together. And um, when they did that, they got this particular response here on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, and then they repeated the whole survey where they used the infinitum dual loop configuration at the same time and, uh, and measured the response and they got the response on the left hand side and if you look at the two they look very similar. So what this is saying is, is that you can take separate surveys from individual transmitters and add them together later after the survey and you'll end up getting something that's equivalent to having a transmitter that's the sum of the two transmitters. So essentially, uh, electromagnetic fields uh, can be added together. Uh, they, uh, they can be super, superposed with each other. So you can construct different transmitters um, by adding together the sums of various transmitters. And that concept is what uh, Josh did when he executed his survey in Sudbury. And this is the, there was a one-line survey with um, uh, relatively small transmitters, 10 by 10 meters, uh, and he had uh, 10 turns and 20 amps flowing in the, in the loop. And there were 25 transmitter positions, and for each of those transmitter positions, he collected the data at, uh, at uh, 25 receiver stations. Um, actually, it was more than 25. Anyway, this, um, the equipment and the crew for this particular survey was provided by Abitibi Geophysics, so thanks for them. So just to give you an example, uh, uh, 
of how this survey was executed, the loop was laid at position 300, as you see here, and then um, the receiver, one receiver was started off at 500 and measured all the way in towards the center, and another receiver was at minus 500 and measured it all the way in towards the center. And once the two receivers met there, the transmitter position was moved by one station, and then the receivers would move out. So the receiver that was measured the left-hand side would go back out again, the receiver that measured the right-hand side would go back out in this direction, and then when they got out to the extremes, the transmitter would be moved again, and then the receivers would come back in again. And then the transmitter would move one station, and then the receivers would go back out. So this was a multi-fold survey with uh, multiple transmitter positions here, 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 and at each time the transmitter was moved, the receivers would measure all the receiver stations. So there was a lot of work in this particular survey. Um, it took about uh, four or five days, I think, to complete the whole line. And the transmitters went from uh, 300 to minus 300. So just to give you an example of how you can combine the, the transmitters together, this top plot here shows the case when the transmitter is at, uh, at, at, three, at 300, and this is the response that you measure here. So there's a lot of noise in here, and there's a vague hint of a response here. There's maybe if you're optimistic, you can see a negative here and a positive here peeking out of the noise. The signal to noise in this case, uh, Josh estimated to be about 1.1. So uh, not a great signal-to-noise ratio. Now then, if you take the receiver responses from that transmitter at plus 300, and you add them to the receiver responses from the transmitter at station 275 and station 250, and add them all together, then you get this profile at the bottom here. So now you can see that this um, negative is becoming much more apparent and the positive is more apparent. So by adding the transmitters together, and getting in effect a bigger transmitter, you can increase the signal-to-noise ratio up to uh, four. So the signal-to-noise is increased by almost a factor of four by increasing the transmitter size by a factor of three. If you take it a step further, and now you have four transmitters, the signal-to-noise goes up uh, um, to a factor of seven. So we're starting to see very strong signal here. And this shows the infinitem case where you have four transmitters uh, on one side of the, of the vertical conductor with one polarity and four transmitters on the other side with the other polarity. And in this case, you get a signal-to-noise ratio of 144. So that just shows you how you can improve the signal-to-noise ratio by combining together um, transmitters. Uh, here's another example to show you that um, uh, the transmitters don't necessarily have to be close. In this case, the reason why the signal-to-noise is so great is because the transmitters are very close to the, uh, to, the, to the body. But if the transmitters are a long way, here we have a transmitter at plus 275 meters uh, with a signal-to-noise of about 1.4. And here, the transmitter is at minus 275 with a signal-to-noise of around 2. And if you add those two together, you end up with uh, this situation where the signal-to-noise is increased. In this case, it's about a factor of 3. So um, this signal-to-noise increase isn't only dependent on the proximity of the transmitter to the body. It's also a function of just adding together the transmitters. So that situation that um, was constructed here in Josh's thesis is of the infinitem configuration that's designed to couple to a vertical conductor at this particular position in the middle of the profile at station zero. Uh, uh, we knew that the body was there, so the survey was designed with station zero being above the body. Um, and the transmitters were added together to enhance the response from that body. But you could, for example, put add together transmitters in different places. For example, if you made them further apart, then they would enhance the response from a body that's deeper. And if you moved them across, uh, they would enhance the response from a body that's off to one side. And if instead of having um, adding together uh, positive transmitters on one side and negative transmitters on the other side, if you added together responses that were all positive, for example, then that would couple to a horizontal body rather than a vertical body. So different combinations of the same transmitter set can be used to excite currents uh, in different places in the Earth and also at different orientations. 
So it just gives you a great deal of flexibility. And there's almost, if you think about it, there's an infinite number of different combinations of, uh, of transmitters that you can sum together in different ways, and that will give you an infinite number of ways that you can look at what's going on in the Earth. So, um, for this multi-transmitter and receiver system, different combinations can illuminate different depths and locations and dips, and we can increase the signal-to-noise ratio. But one issue is, there's an awful lot of data. How do we display those results? So, a couple of people have taken um, uh, some attempts at doing this. The spider plots that Lamontagne and Geophysics developed in the 1990s, uh, uh, which are sort of awkward to look at. Uh, and the, the approach that Josh took when he um, wrote up his thesis was to generate response sections, where you weigh the transmitters so as to focus on a particular location, depth, and dip. And then you look at the responses associated with those, and you weigh those uh, as if they were coming from a response at that particular location, depth, and dip. And the weighting will give you a strong response if there's a body there, and a weak response if there isn't a body there. So these are the sections that uh, Josh produced. So the red that you see in the middle, that's um, the response of the particular body um, uh, at about the position zero. And in this case, the depth he got was around 200 meters deep. Okay, so that's uh, the concept of using multiple transmitters and multiple receivers. Now I want to move on to the second part of the talk, which is uh, looking at three component transmitters. So let's have a little bit of uh, basics first. Let's look at the field from one transmitter. Let's assume that the transmitter is relatively small. It's a dipole transmitter, and it's right here in the middle of the, of the plot at zero, zero. Uh, it's a vertical dipole, so the field from the vertical dipole is pointing up above the dipole, and it's pointing up below the dipole. Off to the side here, it's pointing down, and has half the strength as the field that's pointing up and off to the right here, it's pointing down as well. And every other place uh, on this particular plane, it's pointing at some other angle. So these axes here, this axis of, along the dipole is a special uh, uh, location because the field is pointing in the same direction as the dipole. And this axis out here is also special because the field is pointing in the opposite direction to the dipole. And everywhere else is not special. Now that's just in one plane, but this dipole field is in three dimensions, so you can rotate this around, and if you rotate it around, then this plane uh, off on either side, this uh, axis off on either side actually becomes a plane. So we have two special uh, locations, an axis, a line, and this one here is a plane. So, um, yeah, it's rotationally symmetric. So here we have um, these special axes. So here's the vertical dipole here in black, and this axis up here, the field is parallel, and on this plane here, this is a three-dimensional view, the field is anti-parallel. So that's for a vertical dipole. If you have a horizontal dipole, along this axis here, the field is parallel, and on this blue plane here, the field is parallel as well, anti-parallel. That's for the horizontal to the right, also horizontal into the page, uh, the transmitter is pointing in this direction, and along this dashed axis here, the field is parallel. Along this green plane here, the field is anti-parallel. So we've got three planes and three axes. And the interesting thing is, is that along each axis, the planes intersect. So let's take, for example, this green axis here. You notice that this blue plane goes through that axis, and this red plane goes through the axis as well. So along this red plane, the field is always pointing down. Along this blue plane, the field is always pointing to the left. And along the green axis here, the field is always pointing into the page. So this axis here is at the intersection of these two planes. So along this axis, the fields are always um, perpendicular to each other, um, into the page, to the left, and uh, and, uh, and up. So along this green axis, that's the case. Along the blue axis, it's the case. Along the red axis, it's the case. So that's a special property of a three-dimensional transmitter. You have three, you have uh, fields from that three-dimensional transmitter that are orthogonal to each other along these axes. 
So let's take the example of a, um, of a three component transmitter. Uh, here it is up here at the top right, X, Y and Z. X is to the right, Z is up and Y is into the page. That's our three component transmitter. If I calculate the field from that transmitter in the, this point here, minus 10, minus 10, minus 10 in the ground, A is the field from X, which is pointing into the page. B is the field from Y, which is pointing out of the page. And C is the field from uh, Z, which is pointing back in a little bit. And these fields aren't perpendicular to each other. However, if I take that X, Y, and Z uh, component transmitter and I rotate it, so um, now the Z axis is pointing away from this point here. Uh, and the Y axis is pointing um, into the page and to the left, and the Z, X axis is pointing basically out of the page. Now, this point in the ground is sitting on the axis of that Z component or rotated Z component receiver. So this point here is on that axis of Z and it's also on the plane uh, that's perpendicular to Y and it's on the plane that's perpendicular to X. So the fields here, A rotated, C rotated and B rotated, are perpendicular to each other. So now we have three perpendicular fields in the ground. And if anybody remembers their first year um, uh, um, geometry, you know that if you have three um, orthogonal vectors, you can construct a vector in any direction from those th by adding together those three orthogonal vectors. So that's basically what I say. So you can take a linear combination of those A, B, and C rotated fields in the ground, and you can make the field point up or down or in or out or whatever way you want in order to couple to a body at a particular orientation. So you can do it that way by combining the fields in the ground, but because this is a linear system, you can also do it by a particular linear combination of the transmitters uh, at the surface. So for example, I've taken um, the Z component transmitter and multiplied it by 0.5. I've taken the Y and multiplied it by 0.5. And I've taken the X and multiplied it by minus 0.5. And when I do that, same sum to the A, B, and C vectors in the ground, not the rotated ones, the unrotated ones, then I can make the field point horizontal. Uh, so that will couple to a vertical conductor in the ground. So this is what I call the concept of a directed field. I can take the fields from a three-component transmitter and direct them in any orientation. So I can ensure that I couple to a particular body uh, at a certain orientation in the ground. If the body happens to be in a different orientation, I can just recombine those transmitters in a different linear combination and I can couple to a different body. So I can ensure that I never miss uh, a body. So uh, that's the concept of this directed transmitter. So it's a linear combination or weighting of the original three component transmitters so as to generate a field in any direction at any subsurface location. Um, and if you add together multiple uh, direct transmitters, and you can further strengthen the, the um, you can make the subsurface field stronger. So here's an example where I have uh, 241 transmitter positions at the surface. Here they all are, uh, and each of these little positions here that I'm pointing to is a three-component transmitter. And in some cases, the Z component is bigger than the X and the Y, uh, like this one here. And in other cases, uh, like here, the X component is bigger than the Z and the Y. And all of these transmitters are directed so as to give a horizontal field here uh, at this location that I've marked with a circle. So I have added all these together to give a very strong field here. Uh, and that will ensure that I get a good um, coupling of, of, the, of my 241 transmitters to that body. And that will ensure a good signal-to-noise ratio. So, by adding together all the transmitters, I get a good signal-to-noise ratio. Now, one of the weaknesses of EM methods is that uh, the fields from transmitters are diffuse and they're non-zero everywhere. Uh, and generally, they're largest near the transmitter. So when you add together these fields, um, generally, uh, what happens is, if you look here, uh, we've added together these fields so that they're horizontal at the desired location. Well, you get some very large ones here that are strong and pointing in other directions. And that's because of this diffuse nature of the field. But it turns out that you might be able to do something about that. 
and, and that is to construct a linear combination of the transmitters that will give you a strong field at the location that you want and a weak field at uh, locations that you don't want to couple to. So on the right hand side here, these Bs are the fields at subsurface locations. So B, uh, BJL is the field at the subsurface location L in orientation J. So let's say, for example, that we want the field everywhere to be zero except for one location, this one here. So we can say, well, let's set all these to zero, make this one as big as possible, and then all these other ones zero. And these fields here, these are the fields from the K, uh, L, the K, I think it's the, it's sub, it's the field from the uh, kth orientation uh, at sub subsurface location I in orientation J. Um, so these are all the fields from all the different transmitters. Um, and then you multiply them by weights here in order to give zeros and one here where you want it to be one and zeros elsewhere. So this is a least, uh, least squares problem. You can solve this problem in numbers of different ways. And uh, if you do it uh, just as I did here, for example, you can make the field everywhere zero, uh, except for this location here where it's uh, horizontal, which is the orientation that I desired it to be at. I could have made it vertical if I'd liked, but uh, I asked that it be horizontal here. And these are the orientations of all the different transmitters so as to give the field here being strong and elsewhere to be weak. Now in that example I had 441 transmitter positions and 125 subsurface positions. So you can see that that's a, a, an overdetermined problem and a simple matrix algebra will give you the solution for that. In the next example um, that uh, one of my students, Michael Kalai, put together, he, uh, he had the opposite situation where he had uh, um, nearly a thousand transmitter positions but 16,000 subsurface positions. So this is an underdetermined problem. And uh, when he did that, um, he got something that looks like this. So this is the case where he took all of the transmitters, all the thousand transmitters, and he oriented them so that the field was always vertical. So this would be coupling to a horizontal body. And he added them all together. So this gives a horizontal field at this location. But it also gives these other fields here at these locations. So these fields here, closer to the surface, where the transmitters are close by, are much stronger. So this is um, this directed field case. And then what he tried to do was he tried to minimize the fields away from the body here and here, for example. And in this case, you can see that these fields are now much smaller uh, over here and over here. But here, the fields are still stronger. So in the case where we have an underdetermined problem that hasn't zeroed everything. I'll just flip between these two so you can see them. So I'm going back and forwards. You can see how on the periphery the fields are a lot um, weaker. So it would, if for example, that there was, if there was a horizontal body over here close to the surface, like overburden for example, currents would be induced over here. Uh, but in this case the fields are much weaker so currents wouldn't be. So this gives you an uh, concept of how it might be possible to, to couple more weakly to conductive overburden. This is another case um, where uh, we have, we want to excite uh, currents in a vertical conductor. So now this is a horizontal field here at this location. And you can see we have very strong fields here and here. And these would couple extremely strongly to conductive overburden. And uh, it would be unlikely that we would see the response from this because they'd be swamped by the responses here and here, which are very large. And so now we'll look at the case where uh, he tried to focus the fields of this position. And you can see now that these very strong fields here have disappeared here and here. And now we still get a, a horizontal field here, although we also get horizontal fields here as well. So this particular situation only really has vertical fields here and here. Um, so the impact of the conductive overburden is uh, strongly attenuated. So um, what I'm wanting to show you with these examples is, is that there's a great deal of flexibility and a great deal of um, liberty that geophysicists have with these multiple transmitters 
to sculpt and design the survey in such a way that you can couple strongly to certain bodies and not to other bodies. There's almost an infinite uh, amount that you can do once you've collected the data. After the fact, they can be combined so as to enhance certain features. So the focused EM system is one where you have multiple three component transmitters and then you sum them together in such a way so as to focus on a particular uh, subsurface location in a specific orientation. And it might be possible, for example, to null couple the oval burden when you do this. So um, the other thing that I want to talk about is, um, is this case. Let's say that you focused on this position here um, and you do induce currents in a vertical conductor here then those currents will have a secondary field that's associated with them. And the secondary field um, will be positive and upwards here, for example, uh, negative and uh, downwards here, and uh, horizontal in this case. So the secondary field has a particular shape. And by looking to see what the secondary field is, you can get an idea as to whether or not the response from this particular uh, body is strong. If the responses are all weak, then you know that there's not a body here. Whereas if the responses are strong and are up here and down here, for example, then you know that there's likely a body there. So you can take the data from multiple receivers, uh, as you may have laid out here, and combine those in such a way so as to enhance the response from this particular location. So it's possible to use the multiple receiver data to enhance fields from sp specific subsurface locations. And there's a lot of ways that can be done. You can use cross-correlation methods or weighted sums or other ways of combining these responses. So um, uh, we haven't collected any three component transmitter surveys yet, but if you did, the way you do it was you'd lay out uh, multiple transmitters, so multiple component transmitters, and at each location of the transmitter, you collect multiple receiver locations. And then you combine all these responses after the survey so as to probe multiple subsurface locations um, in the Earth. I just want to point out that the transmitter, um, uh, it's an issue, what does the transmitter look like? And the transmitter uh, could be an airborne transmitter, or, and you could have the receivers on the ground, or vice versa. You could have uh, the receivers airborne and the transmitters on the ground or you could have some sort of other combination, maybe both on the ground or both in the air or something like that. And the advantage of this is that you have a high resolution EM probing of the subsurface. You can focus the fields at a particular location. Uh, uh, if you can get a strong field at a particular um, place, you can see whether or not there's something there. So you might be able to see a small body. And because you can get strong fields, you might be able to look deeper because you get an improved signal to noise ratio. And uh, as I mentioned, you can design the field so as to null couple to unwanted conductors like overburden, for example. Or if you have a particularly difficult survey where you have some non-conductor um, and you want to see if there's any unknown conductors nearby, then you can um, uh, design your survey so as to null couple to those unwanted conductors and to couple to other locations. Okay, so that's um, the multiple transmitter, multiple receiver method. Now I'm going to move on to the last part of the talk, which is uh, the traditional method. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, detecting perfect conductors. And uh, perfect conductors are ones that um, are extremely conductive so that they only really respond uh, with an in-phase response in the frequency domain or if you're talking about the time domain, they only really respond when the transmitter is switched on. And the traditional way of uh, detecting these uh, perfect conductors is to use a rigid transmitter receiver geometry. And uh, you set up the, the geometry of the transmitter and receiver so that um, uh, you can predict what the in-phase response will be um, because of the primary field. And then if it isn't what you predict it to be, then you know that there's some perfect conductor nearby. So uh, that requires some sort of knowledge of the transmitter receiver geometry that by fixing it because you have a rigid system, or by accurately measuring um, the transmitter receiver geometry. And that's not an easy problem to do. Um, uh, myself and some of my students have done some calculations. And in order to be able to detect a body in the ground with a helicopter system, you have to take measurements that are accurate to micrometers, uh, 
10 to the minus 6 meters in order to be able to um, distinguish geometry changes in your helicopter time domain system from the in-phase response of a conductor in the ground. So what I'm proposing in this talk is to use uh, one or more three component transmitters and to use the properties of the three component transmitters to, um, to back out what the, what the uh, in-phase response of the transmitters are. And this requires a three component transmitter and a three component receiver. And you don't need necessarily to know what the, um, the geometry of your transmitter and receiver system is. Uh, and there are a number of ways that you can do this. I'm going to talk about uh, using rotational invariance um, because I think that has some promise, but there are other ways that you can do it as well. So now let's look at, um, let's, um, look at the fields from a three-component transmitter. So if I have a transmitter that's a three-component transmitter, there's an X-directed transmitter, a Y-directed transmitter, and a Z-directed transmitter. And these HX is the field from the X-directed transmitter, HY is the field from the Y-directed transmitter, and HZ is the field from the Z-directed transmitter. And at the receiver, each of those fields has an X and a Y and a Z component. So this HX is a vector with three components, this HY is a vector with three components, and this HZ is a vector with three components. So there's nine components altogether from this three component transmitter. And if you take these vectors, HX, and you dot it with itself, HX, and you use the dipole formula uh, for these, and then you calculate what this dot product is, you get this analytic expression here. HX dotted with HY gives this analytic expression, and HX dotted with HZ gives this analytic expression. HY dotted with HY gives this one, and so on. And these, all of these quantities here are invariant for rotation of your coordinate frame. So if you rotate your coordinate frame, then you still get the same dot product, because the, a vector projected onto another vector will always give you the same length, independent of what your um, orientation of your uh, coordinate system is. So these quantities here are rotational invariants, as are these cross products and this dot product and these cross products down here. And these are the analytic expressions for uh, the fields from a dipole. So let's take, for example, this field here. HX dotted with HY cross HZ gives 2 MX MY MZ over uh, 4 pi R cubed all cubed. So MX, MY, and MZ are the dipole moments of your X, Y, and Z component transmitters. And R is the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. So you can uh, calibrate your system so you know MX, MY, and MZ. So the only unknown is R. So you can work out from this formula what the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is. So now we know R. And then let's say we substitute this R back into this formula here. We know this R, and we know this R. So this Z here, we don't know. We know these MZ over here. So we can use this formula here to work out what Z is. And similarly, we can use this formula here to work out what Y is, and this one to work out what this X is. So from these rotational invariants, we can work out the relative position of the transmitter um, uh, with respect to the receiver or vice versa. So now, um, after the fact, we can work out what the geometry is. Once we know what the geometry is, we can rotate the transmitters. Remember, just like we did at the, at the start of this talk, so that the transmit, one of the transmitters is pointing directly away from the other transmitter. And in that case, the fields at the receiver should all be perpendicular to each other. And when you have uh, perpendicular fields, if you dot HX with HY, and you dot one vector that's perpendicular to another, you get zero. And if you dot HZ with HYX, um, you get zero. And if you dot something with itself, then you get something that's non-zero. So in this case, what you do is you just um, take your fields, work out what the relative geometry is, rotate the transmitter after the fact mathematically, and then work out what these dot products are in that rotated frame. And if they're zero, then you know that you have no uh, perfect conductor around. If they're non-zero, then there must be perfect conductor nearby. So um, this is essentially what you do. Um, also, 
these dot products here are zero. These cross products down here aren't zero. Um, but you can imagine that you know R and you know M. So linear combinations of these cross products can also be made so that these sum to zero. So for example, in this case I've got um, uh, 4 multiplied by this cross product and these cross products scale by ratios of the dipole moment give zero. And in this case, these dot products, uh, for example, this one here is non-zero and this one here is non-zero and this one here is non-zero. If I take 4 times this, as I've done here, and subtract um, uh, the, the z hz dot hz scaled by these dipole moments, then this comes out to be zero as well. So this is equation 28 and this is equation 29. Just put those two numbers away in your short-term memory because we're going to see some plots of that later on. Okay, so um, in working out what r, x, and y, and z are, I have assumed that the field that's coming from the ground is uh, negligible so that we can estimate our transmitter-receiver geometry accurately. And that isn't necessarily always the case, but I've done some calculations here just to show that for the airborne configuration where the field that's coming from the body in the ground is relatively small compared with the primary field, you can estimate x, y, and z and r fairly accurately, and hence when you rotate the uh, transmitter, you can normally um, generate uh, dot products and cross products that uh, give you zero. So this is a, an example, a synthetic example, where I have a, um, uh, a transmitter and receiver uh, flying uh, above a conductive uh, body, and the distance between the transmitter and receiver isn't constant. So you can see it's oscillating up and down by a few meters. Uh, it's oscillating side to side by tens of meters, which is typically what happens in airborne EM systems and is going up and down by five or so meters, which is also fairly typical. And also, the orientation of the receiver is um, changing quite a large amount by upwards of uh, three, four, or even five degrees. The yaw is quite significant. To, so in this case, um, the receiver isn't fixed in a certain orientation. As it flies through there, it's moving around like this. And you can see the yaw is um, um, significantly bigger, so it's moving from side to side. It's moving, pitching backwards and forwards by two or three degrees, and it's rolling from side to side. So the geometry, both in terms of distances and in terms of orientations of the receiver, is changing significantly. So then, um, from this data set, I calculated what the primary field at the receiver would be, and then I calculated the, the rotational invariance, and this is what I got. Hx dot Hx gives this quantity, which moves around. Uh, Hx dot Hy gives this one. Hx dot Hz gives these quantities. And you can see they're all non-zero, and they're all moving around as the transmitter uh, moves backwards and forwards and in and out. So uh, this is why um, uh, toad bird EM systems aren't very good at measuring the in-phase responses because the geometry changes significantly. So the field from the, from the uh, transmitter as measured at the receiver is varying significantly as well. However, using all these uh, dot products here, I can work out what R, X, and Y, and Z are. And then I can change the orientation of the transmitter so that the transmitter is pointing directly away from the receiver. And in that case, the fields from the transmitter should be orthogonal. And then the dot products will be zero in most cases. And when you do that, yes, indeed. In this case, hx dotted with hy is zero, except oh, right at the middle here of the profile. And that's where there was a body. And you, you can see in this case, there's an anomalous response. These quantities here, hy dotted with itself, hx dotted with itself, and hz dotted with itself, aren't zero. But if I combine them in that uh, using the equation 28 and 29, then I get this, which shows zero here, and non-zero right over the body. So this particular system is a very good way of detecting a perfect conductor. But you need a three-component transmitter and a three-component receiver. So we can see these perfect conductors, uh, but we need these three-component transmitters and receivers. But it's not necessary for us to hold the geometry rigid or to measure it. Uh, we just use 
the orthogonal properties of a three-component transmitter um, along those special axes that uh, we talked about. Okay, so some of you probably have some questions, and uh, these are the issues that have to be addressed when you're coming up with a, an EM system. You need to know what MX, MY, and MZ, the dipole moments of the transmitters are. These should be well calibrated, and it's uh, possible to do this. There's uh, devices that can measure the uh, transmitter and the currents that are flowing in the transmitters and receivers, and you can calibrate them fairly well uh, in the air to work out what the loop areas and things like that are. So uh, generally, we can work out what MX, MY, and MZ are. Also, you have an issue where you have three transmitters that are all transmitting at once. And so how do you distinguish that one field is coming from the X component transmitter and another field is coming from the Y component transmitter? So one way of doing that is to transmit sequentially. So you turn off all the transmitters except, for example, the X, and you transmit from that, and then you turn off the X, and then you turn on the Y, and transmit from that, and then you turn off the Y, and then you just turn on the Z and transmit from that, and in that way, you sequentially go through X, Y, and Z, and you can build that up. It's not very efficient because um, it takes three times as long, and uh, if you're flying over a body, you might uh, fly over it very quickly and only collect X data, for example, and not Y and Z. So uh, a solution to that is to multiplex the data, and you can do that in the frequency domain or in the time domain. So, for example, you could transmit uh, uh, multiple frequencies or uh, multiple brace frequencies in the time domain. So this is an example of um, the SkyTem um, helicopter time domain EM system. And this system, uh, it transmits sequentially. So it will transmit uh, some waveforms at 222 hertz, the so-called low moment transmitter. And then that transmitter will switch off, and then they'll switch on their high moment transmitter, and uh, they will collect data at uh, 25 hertz. So that's the sequential mode. Um, and also there's the multipulse system that I guess uh, this KEGS audience heard about uh, in September, I guess CGG introduced, where they transmit the, the high moment and the small moment simultaneously. So um, here's an example of a system where you have uh, three component transmitters, and in this case uh, one of them will operate at a base frequency of 29.5 hertz, another one will operate at a base frequency of 30 hertz, and the third one will operate at a base frequency of 30.5 hertz. And for purposes of illustration, I've made one a square waveform, one a triangular waveform, and one a half sine waveform. And if you add all these together uh, and you measure the response at one receiver, you get something that looks like this. So when they're in sync, they all line up. But later on, uh, half a second later, they're all out of sync. And you can see that um, uh, uh, it's a quite a confusing mess. Half a second later, they're all going to be back in sync again. So this uh, situation here is quite complex, but because all the base frequencies are different, you can stack them at different base frequencies, and you can separate them back out. So here we have uh, this waveform here. If this is, uh, if this is stacked at, um, at the lower frequency, which in this case is 29.5 uh, hertz, you get the square wave back. This is the triangular wave when you stack it at 30 hertz, and this is the uh, half sine wave when you stack at 30.5 hertz. Now for this particular combination, uh, 29.5, 30, and 30.5, uh, this one here, you get pretty much zero in the off time, but these ones you get um, a small signal, about a thousandth of a thousandth of the signal um, in the off time. You can just see a tiny little bit of hashing down here. Um, and uh, that's a function of the particular base frequencies that you've chosen. If you chose slightly different base frequencies, 29.5 as before, 30 as before, but now it goes up to 30, 31.0. And if you uh, add these ones together and then stack them, then you don't get any of that um, strange signal. Um, and in this particular case, uh, there's primary field, as you can see, the square wave, but there's also a secondary that's been added in. And this secondary can be identified. And it turns out that um, we added a secondary that had a, 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 lo a short decay time to this one. Uh, secondary had a longer decay time here and even longer here. And indeed, you do see um, short and long decay times in this data. So the secondaries uh, don't get mixed up as well, neither do the primaries. So it's possible to have different base frequencies for these tr three transmitters 
and to separate them out afterwards uh, in post-processing. Okay, how are you going to build a three-component transmitter? That's a big question. And um, Scott Hogg, you might remember this uh, diagram. This is the famed Helitem system. You remember that one? Yeah. yeah. I managed to find this picture of it. And it's interesting. Here's the picture of the concept of it. And it's a horizontal uh, loop here, vertical dipole. In this case, this is the horizontal dipole, which is pointing along the direction of the bird. But the actual manifest, the actual system that was built has the vertical uh, dipole loop here, but a different orientation for the, uh, for the actual one. So this is the concept in the, in the um, I guess in the original publication, and this is one of the actual systems that were built. So you can see how things change from, from concept to reality. So this is a two-component transmitter. So you can imagine that if you could build a system like this uh, with two components, it's not a lot difficult to build a system with three components. Um, this system wasn't necessarily successful. That's because they were trying to measure a response here inside. The receiver was here in the middle of a loop where the fields are really strong. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, if you take the receiver away from the middle of this three-component transmitter and, and have it further away, then it will be a lot easier to measure the fields. So that's one way of having a three-component transmitter. Um, you could also do the same thing on a fixed-wing aircraft. This is a picture of a, um, of a minesweeper system developed by the Vichy French during the Second World War. They have a transmitter loop on their aircraft. And you can see that um, uh, the transmitter loop goes above the aircraft here and below here. So if you move this one here back a little bit and this one at the back forward a little bit, then this would be an X-directed uh, uh, transmitted dipole. So it is possible to put loops around aircraft that may be oriented in a different direction uh, by putting the wires below and above. And here's a picture of one of the very first airborne EM systems ever built. This is the Stan Mac McFar system uh, that was patented in 1948. And the particular loop here is, goes around the, the fuselage, runs along the bottom of the fuselage here, around the nose of the aircraft, and up the top. So this is a Y-directed transmitter. So in this case, it's, uh, this is just one example of how you can build a Y-component transmitter. And this is another example. This is the INCO system from 1969, which shows another Y-component transmitter, in this case, um, above the aircraft. The reason why this... Um, Anson system was successful because this aircraft was made out of wood and cloth. And so you could have the transmitter wrapped around the fuselage of the aircraft because the aircraft wasn't conductive. But the Twin Otter system that you see here does have a, um, a metallic skin, and so you had to have the transmitter away from the aircraft. But anyway, it's possible to build these Y-directed transmitters, and there's no reason why you couldn't do it now. Here's another example of a hunting canso system, which has a Z component uh, transmitter as in the traditional way, but there's also what they call a compensating coil here that's uh, X directed. And so this um, could be used as a transmitter, for example. And here are some other examples. Uh, this is the ABM system. This is a Z directed transmitter, and this is a Y directed transmitter. This is the McFar F400 system, which has got an X directed transmitter up here. Uh, this is the Tridem system that uh, Kenting and Simtrex built. Uh, and this has three X component transmitters, each operating at different frequencies. So, uh, and here's the, um, the Questor Heli Input system from 1982, which is a Z component um, transmitter. So, uh, there's nothing new under the sun here. It's possible to build these um, multiple component transmitters. It's just a matter of, of somebody. Uh, spending the time uh, and the money that is required to do it. Here's another concept that could be used. Uh, this is a helium balloon um, transmitter system that was put together by uh, Stettler, and he reported on this at a Saga meeting in 2009. It's, uh, here's the helium balloon here, uh, and this is, the, this is a Z component transmitter that's wound around the, the equator of the... Um, of the, of the helium balloon. But you could imagine uh, an X and the Y component that are wound around some of the lines of, uh, of, uh, of uh, latitude in, the, say, for example, one to split the, the, uh, the hemisphere into east and west and another one into uh, uh, front and back. 
Okay, and then the other issue that we have to address is uh, um, having multiple receivers. And uh, I think this is going to be something that's uh, going to be available quite soon. SJG Physics are working on this, Zong, uh, RMIT, Abitibi, and EMIT are all working on uh, fairly cheap um, receiver systems. This example here is the uh, the ARMIT sensor that uh, Abitibi Geophysics use uh, on the ground, it's three component uh, receiver and uh, if you wanted to, you could um, manufacture a large number of these and uh, collect data with them. So, um, in conclusion, um, multifold uh, transmitters and receivers will be used more in the future. Uh, the three component uh, transmitters will provide more coupling orientations in the ground and the ability to direct the field and uh, we can manipulate the data post-survey when we have um, uh, multiple transmitters in order to emphasize or suppress conductors of interest or um, of non-interest res respectively. And uh, a three component transmitter and a three component receiver system is capable of detecting a perfect conductor um, uh, uh, fairly easily. So just some um, acknowledgements, acknowledgements here. This three component transmitter and its concepts has been patented by Laurentian and it's been licensed to CGG and uh, these are all the people I'd like to acknowledge who've, uh, who helped put this, um, this presentation together. Josh Limburn is in the audience here and I think some of the other people uh, who I'm acknowledging here may well be uh, um, tuned in to the internet. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. How interesting. I didn't even know we can do all these things. I want to see the applied side. Of so do I. <laughs> uh, questions? Yes, yeah. Scott. It's, sorry, Scott. Uh, I was just kind of thinking, I was hoping you probably some tree by the Doug Fraser's paper back in the 70s, which, um, he promoted and brought up this idea of three axis transmitter receiver, tail, tail, cord, what do you call it, tail, tail, fishtail, and coaxial. Yeah. So the whole, all the benefits of that um, were presented by him. He actually tried to patent. I think he was given a patent. We all had a joke in the industry that yeah. he can't patent subtraction with his kind of things. <laughs> but like all the work that Bidget has done in my days at Air that the previous the whole interpretation thing is based on this three-axis transmitter, which is primarily two-axis because the whale tail wasn't contributing that much. Yeah. But when you when you have a superimposed dipole system and you transmit and you rotate the field 90 degrees from both linear to coaxial, you get all this great benefit. And uh, when you pointed out the time domain system that we did at Arrow, that, that the system actually worked over two. Um, I supervised the building of one. We got one flight and it worked. It's published in uh, this presentation at SEG. <laughs> we never got my back after they chopped that one of the chainsaws after they left. We built a system that didn't work at all. So your pictures, the one you showed at the schematic, yeah. is my system. The picture you had is the one that never worked. <laughs> 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 it came out about five years later. Yeah. But I think it, the benefits of this, I, I, fully support the three axis transmitter receiver, but there's all sorts of documentation and experience yeah. with it in terms of the, the DGEM and Aerodet helicopter frequency main system. Yeah, okay. Uh, I guess I can't summarize that question because it wasn't really a question, but maybe I can just say some things. Um, the DGEM 2 system you're talking about was a single axis transmitter and three component receiver. No, no. The, they were um, there were slightly different frequencies, and to operate simultaneously, you had, say, 700 hertz, 800 hertz, 900 hertz. So the idea was you were exciting the ground at essentially the same frequency. Yeah. But you had a, a vertical trans vertical dipole and a horizontal dipole, and a vertical receiver and a horizontal receiver. Yeah, so that's really three, no, two, you had two the, EM systems. Well, you're rotating the inducer yeah. from the ground by 90 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. So you, the beauty of it was, you want to transmit a position that you know coupled with the, the source in the ground, yeah. and the other transmitter that you not know coupled. Yeah. And, and the benefits that are huge. Yeah, I agree. The benefits of that system are good. But this, 
This system is a little bit different in that it's a, it's a three-component transmitter and a three-component receiver. So that's the concept. Well, it's, hard to do right. yeah. but, uh, it's worth mentioning that the INCO airborne EM system, at the end of its life, is actually quite similar to this, except for they just had two-component transmitter and two-component receiver. And they tried to fly such that one was pointing down towards the other, like, like this. And, and that worked really well as long as it was a calm day. So on a calm day, the Sudbury Airport would have all these systems taking off, and they'd fly around. And if it got too windy and things started to move too much from side to side, they'd have to land. And, uh, and they were basically doing the same thing. They said, the response down the axis is twice as big as the response in this direction. So if you take this one and multiply by two and subtract it from that, you get zero. So that's essentially the same concept that I'm talking about here, except for I'm talking about it three components. So yeah, no. then you don't have to worry about whether the thing's flying from side to side and that sort of thing. No, I, I completely agree. Yeah. The ideal, the execution is the hard side. Yeah. If I knew Scott, I would have asked you to come here oh, <laughs> from the sorry. beginning. <laughs> Great. Yeah, you, you use this technique to remove the dependence of Trend of receiver geometry, usually that can be very um, <laughs> Did you calculate what the allowable error in the orthogonality of your transmitter trio and your receiver trio? Yeah, that's a good question. And and I thought about it. And partially you can account for the lack of orthogonality because even if they aren't orthogonal, you can find a linear combination of the non-orthogonal ones in order to give you a combination that is orthogonal. So as long as two of them aren't lined up, you can construct from, from that non-orthogonal basis set, you can calculate an orthogonal basis set. I don't remember if you remember your linear algebra from first year, but any, any, any three vectors can be linearly combined so as to give an orthogonal basis set. It's basically what you do when you calculate what the, what the inverse of a matrix is. You work out what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. So, you, if they're not orthogonal, you can calculate a set that is orthogonal. Yeah, um, you have to have a measure of how not orthogonal they are. That still is an accuracy limit. Then. Yeah, yeah. Especially if it's uh, an airborne system that's moving. Well, this is you're basically making the same statement that Scott was making. That you know the proofs in the pudding have to build it. So somebody has to invest the money in. Well, Greg's system is the one that's sort of. Account, yeah. In the sense you had fixed everything was rigid transmitter receiver and two. Yeah. So it's factory ninety three differences. Yeah. And and it worked. So it's the the, the um, what I call it, the direction you're going is hundred percent. But the the only I think the only systems that come close to pulling it off in terms of control have been the uh, like the Digim Aerodat systems mm -hmm. fixed yeah. And, and operate on a timeshare basis or, yeah. or multiple frequencies. So both, both work in that way. It's a little more limited, but they, the proof of the pudding that what you're talking about is right. You can control it. Yeah. Well, the other thing is accounting for the loops flapping around. You know, and you have to do something about that. And so maybe you just average them over a few seconds. I mean, generally, it's not a problem. In existing systems, we have to find out if it's a problem with this system. Yes? Richard, you pointed out quite correctly that with multiple transmitters and receivers, you can uh, optimize the signal to noise ratio. And you can also focus spatially. Yeah. You can't do both optimally at the same time. In other words, there's a trade off the more you focus, the worse your signal to noise ratio. Yes, that's right. I mean, essentially what you're saying, and I agree, when, when you direct the fields, you get the maximum strength possible. When you try and focus it, it's not quite as strong. So um, uh, Michael did some calculations, and he actually came to the conclusion that it's best to direct and then analyze the secondary field using the receivers in order to be able to focus in on particular signals coming from the particular location that you've directed the field at. So um, what I was trying to get across here is more the concepts. I was trying to sort of explain to people what the ideas and concepts are. The actual execution is, it's a great research project. I mean, I think graduate students could be busy for years working on this stuff and all the different options. 
Any other questions? I don't think we have any questions online. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for. Oh, well, one more. So you said the vertical uh, transmitter would be on the air home or on the ground? Either. Either. I mean, it just depends on the terrain that you're uh, you're surveying. You, if you're if you're if you're surveying in an area where there's a lot of trees, you can have the three component transmitter flying by. If you're surveying in an area where it's arid and open and there aren't a lot of trees around, it might be easier logistically to have a three component tr transmitter on the ground. And and you're right. If you if you want to have two flying around, well, maybe you could do that. Maybe you could have maybe you could have a transmitter flying around on a balloon, like I indicated on the helium balloon, and you could have little drones flying around with their receivers, and you could have a hundred of those. Just as long as they didn't collide with each other. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? While you have access to Richard, no. <laughs> yeah. Nothing online. Uh, maybe. Okay. So the question is, if you want to have a three transmitter, three receiver with rigid loop to the system, will the system be too heavy, or the system will not have enough power? Uh, if you have a rigid system, will it be too heavy? And I guess the answer to that is it depends. The more rigid you want to make a system, the heavier it is. So that could be a problem. But the trade-off here is you don't necessarily have to have this system to be too rigid. So it might be possible to build a system that's semi-rigid and still get good signal-to-noise ratio. Thank you. Nothing else online? Thank you, Richard. Thanks for the time. Thank you.